you help people redefine what's possible. Yes, ma'am. And I want to hear you speak on that because you 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 alluded to it in your comment before, which was we we discover what our beliefs are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our beliefs serve us, and sometimes they don't. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's just go to. Let's just... Is that there's such a difference between pain and suffering. I really truly believe that pain propels us, suffering keeps us stuck. Right? One of, one of my favorite sports quotes, I put it on a poster and marketed it all over the NFL. Exhaustion is acceptable. <laughs> the barrier be between, you know, what's the difference between you going through the steps of service before self and then someone else and then the opportunity that you asked for, right, um, along your way or that you said yes to when the opportunity came down the conveyor belt of life, right? That's and a great question. So, so I would suspect that if you and I decided to team up and attend someone else's conference, Hello, everyone. Welcome, Thrivers, to the Thrive with Sharon podcast. I, as always, I think I say this every time, but each time I keep topping the guests with who we are able to attract onto the show. And today I have no one better than the Dan Clark joining me today. And I have had a few occasions to be in his presence and hear him speak. And um, one of our friends in common, Amberly Lago said, oh my gosh, Dan Clark is incredible. And now I know why. Uh, real quickly, I want to just introduce a few things about Dan. He is the founder and CEO of a multi-million dollar international communications company, a university professor, a high performance business coach, a podcast host, a gold record songwriter, filmmaker, New York Times bestselling author of 37 books, a primary contributing author to Chicken Soup for the Soul series, and an award-winning athlete who fought his way back from a paralyzing injury that cut short his football career. Dan has been inducted into the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame, was named one of the top 10 motivational speakers in the world, and has spoken to more than 6,000 audiences, to over 6 million people in 73 countries. To most of the Fortune 500, Super Bowl champions, the United Nations, and to our military combat troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and Dan has appeared on over 500 television and radio shows, including Oprah, Glenn Beck, and has been featured in Success Magazine, Forbes, Entrepreneur Inc., Sports Illustrated, Millionaire, and the Mayo Clinic Journey, Journal. Clark's inspiring life includes soaring to the edge of space in a U-2 spy plane, flying fighter jets with the Air Force Thunderbirds, racing automobiles at Nürburgring, serving on the Olympic committee and states, uh, carrying the Olympic torch in the winter games, receiving the United States Distinguished Service Medal, America's highest civilian award presented by the Secretary of the Air Force, and most importantly being named Utah, Utah's of the Year. Please welcome 
funny man with a serious message, Dan Clark. Uh, you're so funny. I almost interrupted you nine times. I felt like you were giving my, my eulogy at my funeral. And I'm like, you know, I haven't heard that for a while. And kind of gagged me with the Toyota. Thanks for flattering me. I love you. I honor you. You're amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking as I'm reading this, I'm like, wow, how many lifetimes did you have to live to really forge all of these accomplishments? But Dan, you're, I, I'm honored to have you here uh, first and foremost, but I love one of the things that I think I always, I always, we're, we're, we're reflections of one another in some way, right? We're mirrors of one another. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I've had a lot of feedback about my own career. And we were just talking a little bit um, before we recorded that, you know, I've had pivoted many different times, right? I have this interest in exploration, personal exploration, as well as being able to, wherever I am, I grow, right? I like to shine. I like to be able to help. I like to experience life, right? And just gathering from what I just read, we are kindred spirits. Yeah. I would love to know how it was that you decided to endeavor into public speaking and into some of these, ex everything is like very experiential, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And nothing happens to us. Everything happens for us. And when we accept that reality, you never lose if you always learn. You know, I don't want you to think I'm a walking cliche, but in my experience, which I know I've shared with you in some vicarious way, what we both discovered is that pain is a signal to grow, not to suffer. And once we learn the lesson that the pain is teaching us, the pain goes away. So in life, there's no mistakes, only lessons. And as I've had an opportunity to interact with so many special forces, Navy SEALs, uh, Air Force, air combat controllers and first responders, firefighters, police officers, I'm always intrigued by why they have the desire and the calling to run towards the sound of the guns, to run into a burning building when everybody else is running away from the danger and out of the burning building screaming. And it's, it's because they were not born that way. They were made, they were developed based on their mindset, based on their belief, their core values. So if you really think about it, Sharon, regardless of how brutal life seems to be, no matter how many bumps we you know, cruise over or hop over in this, this bumpy road of life, no one ever hits, hits rock bottom. We hit rock foundation. We hit rock belief. We hit the baseline core values on which we were raised. And regardless of how brutal the economy seemed to be during this two-year span of COVID, they never hit, our organizations never hit rock bottom. They hit the baseline governing principles on which they were built. So the question of the day of every day is, is your current belief strong enough and deep enough and true enough to equip you and empower you to respond to rapid change. Because from a Navy SEAL, Marcus Luttrell and Robert O'Neill shamelessly dropping names of some of my heroes, they remind us that under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your level of training. Yes. And if you can up-level your attitude, your mindset, your approach to everything that happens for you, Mm. You'll agree with them that under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You have a, a high-bred, up-level belief that it's not enough to say, I will do my best. We must succeed in doing that which is necessary, predicated on the people we hang around with that support us in our belief. And that's why it's an honor for me to be on your podcast, an honor for me to finally get to know you, my, my, my friend. Oh, Dan, thank you. <laughs> yeah, really, it's it it is. It's just such a beautiful mutual energetic exchange for sure. Um, and I I love what you said about the fact that when we hit these moments, right, where we do sometimes we feel like the 
floor literally just disappears out from underneath us. To, to learn that self-trust in a way where you can say, you know what? I know that I will be able to handle this situation, right? Yes, and I love part of what your message is in what you deliver to organizations as well as in your own you know, public speaking and in your books and you help people redefine what's possible. Yes, ma'am. And I want to hear you speak on that because you, you, you alluded to it in your comment before, which was we, we discover what our beliefs are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our beliefs serve us and sometimes they don't. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's just go to, let's just go to the fundamental facts of, of, of reality in business, excuse me, in medicine, we know the prescription before, mal before <laughs> in medicine, we know that prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. So we've all been conditioned to believe that in order to get a better answer, we have to ask a better question. But in listening to some of your previous podcasts and the guests and the magnificent questions that you ask them, I agree with you that sometimes it's not enough just to ask the right questions. We must question the answers and figure out what really is, not what seems to be. And so in that mindset, the way I got into public speaking, which was your original question, the reason why I still feel called to do this is because I realized that why the reason why I was paralyzed physically and emotionally, and I'll have to give you the details in a second, was because I was asking the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. So most of us on this podcast have got to pause long enough to evaluate the question and answering system that, that we currently subscribe to, and then be man and woman enough to change, to pivot, to recalibrate if necessary, so that we can actually get more than we think we want, we'll actually want what we get so we don't die with our music still in us. Oh. So let me just tell you my story very, very quickly. I played football for 13 years total. One day in practice, the dream ended. We had a tackling drill, coach blew the whistle, two of us ran into each other full speed. Only parts of our bodies that made contact, Lyle's helmet crashed into my helmet in a violent head-on collision. My right shoulder was smashed into the cutting edge of my fiberglass pads and we slammed to the ground. And when Lyle got off of me, my eye drooped. I had loss of speech. I couldn't talk anymore. My right side was paralyzed. My arm dangled helplessly at my side. I stayed paralyzed. Fast forward, I stayed paralyzed for 14 months, physically and emotionally. I went to 16 of the very, very best doctors in all of North America, 15 of whom told me I would never get any better. How many of you have heard that? What happens if we believe it? We never get any better. And my life hit a downward spiral until I hit what I thought was rock bottom. And we've already dispelled that, that supposed definition. Yeah. But to be honest, my life unraveled and suicidal thoughts, confusion. And the reason why was because I confused who I was with what I did of any of you. I, I thought I was a football player when in reality, that's not who I am as a man. It's just what I did. And when we identify ourselves in terms of what we do instead of who we are, we become a human doing instead of a human being or a human becoming mm -hmm. unacceptable of significance is what we seek. So now that I've recovered, the two most frequently asked questions, Sharon, are these. Why did I go to so many different doctors? And it takes us right back to the beginning of our conversation. I kept going from doctor to doctor until I found one who believed I would get better. So think about it. From a leadership perspective, the purpose of a leader is to grow more leaders who believe what you believe, not generate more followers. Think about it. Every culture is created between the strongest belief, the highest expectation, and the best behavior that the leader lives by, and the weakest belief, the lowest expectation, and the worst behavior that the leader tolerates. So if you want to create a, 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 a high-performance culture of significant partner leaders where everybody leads with and without a title, 
The idea is to shrink the difference between what we believe are strongest, powerful, most irrefutable beliefs and what we're unwilling to tolerate. And as we shrink that distance, we get what we want, but more importantly, we want what we get so we don't die with our dreams and, and goals and music inside of us. And then the second most frequently asked question is very, very obvious. I stayed paralyzed for 14 months because I was asking the wrong questions. I was asking the doctors how to get better when I should have been asking myself why. And once we answer why, figuring out the how to becomes clear and simple. So because you're into metaphysics, because you're an intuitive, because you're a natural gifted healer, obviously from a spiritual preparation perspective, you have this innate ability, obviously, to ask the right questions. And only when we ask the right questions and in the process question the previous stereotypical status quo answers, can we find who we really are, discover who we really are, not, I, I misspoke, we don't find ourselves, we create ourselves. Mm. Where do most people go find themselves? Boulder, Colorado. You and I <laughs> could knock on a bus. We could meet from Jersey and, and Phoenix, Arizona. And when we pulled into Boulder, Colorado, we would actually see people walking out in the bushes with backpacks on looking for themselves. <laughs> they think they can, they can go out there, hey, come out from behind that tree. They think they're playing hide and go seek with themselves. Hey, where have you been my whole life? Finally nice to meet me. Where have you been my whole life? No, self is not discovered. Self is created based on your mantra. What are we willing to ask ourselves in finding the right and true irrefutable answers? And only when we find those true irrefutable answers can we trust ourselves. And we must first trust ourselves before we can trust someone else. We must first like and love ourselves before we can truly like and love someone else. Mm. And that's the significance and essence of what I learned coming back from my injury. It wasn't a, a rah rah you can if you think you can. It was it was based in the understanding of the mind, the body, the the brain, the spirit. May I give you an example? Yes. What fascinates me so much about you, Sharon, is your in depth understanding of both sides of the brain. Yeah, I've studied you, my dear. I checked you out. You're amazing. You're the real deal. So How did you know I was thinking that. <laughs> There's two parts of the brain, the neo, neocortex and the limbic parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. The neocortex is responsible for language and consciousness, mm -hmm. decision-making. Mm -hmm. The limbic part of the brain is responsible for feelings and intuition, which create me memories and energy flow. Mm -hmm. And you notice that our language and our feelings reside in two separate parts of the brain. That's why it's so difficult for us to explain how we feel. Mm -hmm. That's why, as we were talking, how magnificent and powerful a kiss is. Yeah. Where without using any words at all, you can convey and transfer passion and real love and trust and emotion in a way that is so significant what would happen if we could do that in our own selves based on what is happening around us? And then in that intuitive state, in that spiritual place, we communicate one with another. Oh my gosh, it, it would change everything. So think about this. When I got, when I, when I recovered from my injury, I was paralyzed for 14 months. It took another six months to recover only beginning when I understood what we're talking about. You see, back to my answer, why did I stay paralyzed for 14 months? What took me so long to recover? What, took, what takes people so long to pivot out of COVID, to become innovative as a result of this pandemic? It relates to all of us. And here's the solution, my friends. Here's the answer. Guaranteed, we can all change and up-level our existence if we just simply understand what I discovered, which I hope the rest of the world will soon catch on. When we only identify a how and a what, it only engages the head. But when we identify a why and a compelling want, which is a goal, a meaningful goal, it connects the head with the heart. And biologically and physiologically, we know that when you engage the head with the heart, our blood starts to pump more rapidly, our brains fire, 
and our muscles engage. And when we only identify the what and the how, no such emotional experience or spiritual experience or intuitive experience or transfer of energy experience occurs. So the last analogy is if you stub your toe, if you're walking through the house in the dark and you stub your toe on the leg of a table and it hurts, that's obviously a physical activity. And the way our bodies are wired physically and electronically, when you stub your toe on that leg of the table, it sends an electronic message to the brain. The brain records the pain, but it is the mind. The brain and the mind are not the same. Correct. It's Correct. the mind that interprets how we will either react or respond in a negative or positive way to that electric impulse in the brain. Yes. And that's what happens when we when 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 we have an emotional hurt a physical hurt mm. a spiritual hurt it's still our choice meaning that adversity is what introduces us to ourselves no one will ever know how strong we are until being strong is our only choice i went on for way too long without a breath but hopefully you followed my thinking because it's the reason why i'm here and in reality sharon if I had not been paralyzed, you and I would have never met. I would not be on this podcast, which means we can't avoid discomfort. We must on purpose create discomfort, stretch, push ourselves to our ultimate capacity and potential as a human being, take risks, face our fears. Don't misunderstand me. My accident was, what, was not one of the best things that ever happened to me, but who I became as a man and what I learned about time and your understanding of metaphysics and priorities in my life as a result of going through that setback clearly makes it one of the best things that ever happened to me, which takes us full circle. This is so critically important that you and I met, but the reason why we met is because I now know, and I know you agree, that things happen for a reason, Yes. but it's our responsibility to determine what that reason is. And as you and I discussed way before you pushed record and we went live, you and I have met for a reason. Now it's our responsibility to determine what that reason is. And you and I both agree. It's to do something larger than we've ever done as individuals. It's to team up heart to heart, mind to mind, brain to brain, spirit to spirit, belly to belly, horse lover to horse lover, and change <laughs> the world one person, one story at a time. Oh gosh, yes, 100%. And, you know, to circle back to something that you said, um, that we have the feeling and we have the thought and the thought comes from our brain, but the mind gets to decide the meaning behind the thought. It's that brain heart coherence that you're speaking of right? It's the coherence. Coherence is harmony, right? And so when we find the connect, when we understand, right? So the first step to any kind of a healing or change or transformation, which you've beautifully mapped out is the fact that the first thing is we need awareness, right? So we need to be aware of what is my situation, you know, um, and, and you in your own journey, especially through your accident, you know, you had to sit with yourself, right? What, what's going on? Where am I? What's my starting point? Can I do this? What can I do? What's in the way? And usually whatever that thing is, is that it's a conflict, right? Sometimes it's a physical conflict. Sometimes it's like, well, the nerves and the nervous system aren't signaling to the area that helps me to move my left foot, right? Okay. So how the heck do I get my body on board, right? How do I do that? What's in the way? What's the conflict, right? Sometimes we do need the medical intervention. Sometimes we need the spiritual intervention. Sometimes that's why we're not any, we're not, we're never just one thing, we're always many things all at the same time, right? It's a beautiful kleidoscope of, of existence, Absolutely. right? 
And I love, love, love the fact that you took that journey and you went into your own inner discovery of who you really truly were in that moment. And again, it's what you were representing in that moment, right? It wasn't, this is your, this is your, you know, for the rest of your life sentence. This is just, who am I in this moment? And where do I really want myself to continue to live in this space, right? What space do I want to live in? If it's not here, where can I, what do I need to do? What changes? How do we adapt, right? And redefining what's possible. And I also love before I ask you another question or kick the ball back to you, because I, I can already see that your wheels are turning, right? But the thing that is interesting is that we do, I think that pain does propel us, right? Pain can propel us, um, you know, speaking into what you so beautifully stated before. But well, I think the, there's- the, the dog will not move off the nail. He is sitting <laughs> on until the nail starts to hurt enough. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But I really, I firmly believe this is part of, this is part of just the essence of, 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 of my own um, beliefs and what I've learned so far is that there's such a difference between pain and suffering. I really truly believe that pain propels us, suffering keeps us stuck, right? One of, one of my favorite sports quotes, I've put it on a poster and marketed it all over the NFL, exhaustion is acceptable. Falling is acceptable. Puking is acceptable. Crawling is acceptable. Blood, sweat, and tears are acceptable. Disappointment, discouragement, and sadness are acceptable. But blaming, complaining, whining, and quitting are not. You cannot quit. It's a league rule. Think about that. And that's just the mindset. Wow. You know, it's easier to act your way into positive thinking than it is to think your way into positive action. If you're, if you're lonely, if you're sad, if you're experiencing halts, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or sad, you're not depressed. Mm. You can fix any one of those five distorted emotional conditions without medication, which changes your internal energy, which gives you the reason to get up and go again if you believe that service before self is the remedy for anything that ails us, especially when we're feeling down. Mm, mm, yeah. How did you arrive at service before self? I'm curious. Mostly through my experience with the military. Mm. Because the Air Force is, they have, they have what is called their three core values, integrity first, service before self, and a commitment to excellence in all that you do. And the reason why that resonated with me is because it was my chance to serve my country. I've never been in a military uniform. And I, as a public speaker, was given the opportunity to be the keynote speaker at the US Navy Admirals Leadership Conference in Pensacola, Florida. And it was held at the Naval Museum. So when I walked in the F-18 fighter jets, the Blue Angels, were in their diamond formation hanging from the ceiling with their wingtips only 18 inches apart. And I was fascinated by this. And as I finished my 90 minute speech, knock on wood, I, you know, they were doing the wave and name of their future children after me, it went pretty well. <laughs> and I returned back to the back of the room and sat down next to four-star Admiral Clark and three-star Admiral Dwyer. And they said, Clark, that was amazing. What can we do for you? And I noted, noted in my mind, I just donated this multi-thousand dollar keynote speech, giving it for free as a way to serve my country. So in my mindset, I thought, hey, I want to ride an F-18 jet. And they said, no problem. So two weeks later, I flew into Baltimore, Maryland, rented a car, drove into Patuxent River, Maryland, went through a full day of training. The next day, I got to fly an F-18 fighter jet. I was in the back seat, but in the 90 minute sortie, the pilot allowed me to take the stick for 30 out of the 90 minutes, you know, twice the speed of sound, 7.1 G's, unbelievable, upside down, inside out, bombing <laughs> runs, thrill of a lifetime. I landed and everyone wants to know, okay, Clark, did you pop your cookies? Let me just say I was upside down so long. 
I think I'm the only human being who ever threw down. <laughs> and it was an exhilarating experience. So obviously, as a public speaker and motivational humorist, I told that story in a convention a couple of weeks later, and I made it funny. And as soon as I finished, this colonel in the United States Air Force beelines to the front of the stage, and he says, you want to ride in a real jet? I said, yes, sir. He said, if you'll come and speak to my five squadrons at Hill Air Force Base, uh, I will give you a ride in an F-16. I said, I'm all yours. So long story shorter, I spoke and went well, gave me my ride in, in this F-16. We went over to the bombing range. We did air-to-air -air combat. We chased an F-16, chased us, did the whole deal, whole deal caught 9.4 Gs. Unbelievable experience. And a month later, Colonel Johnny Wida was transferred from Hill Air Force Base to be the commandant at Maxwell Air Force Base, Montgomery, Alabama, home of U US Air Force Air University. And as the commandant, he invited me to come down and speak to the graduating class of captains. And from July 2001 to 2013, I spoke to every single graduating class. I was on, on base every five and a half weeks to every wow. single class between 2001 and 2013, always donating my time and volunteering my service. And in that process, I've had a chance to fly all the fighter jets, all the bombers. I, 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 I've you know, been downrange eight times firing up the troops and the culmination of all these experiences happened when I was at the Pentagon walking through the halls as a volunteer a Pentagon appointee serving with a, a, on the National Civic Leaders Board of the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And I ran into General Paul McGillicuddy, who had been the base commander at Maxwell Air Force Base Air University. I'd spoken for him and his wife so many times. Clark, what are you doing here? I'm serving on this board. I just got transferred to Beale Air Force Base. Will you come and speak to my troops? I said, yeah, if you'll give me a ride up into space in a U-2 spy plane. He said, I can't do that, Clark. You're a civilian. I said, why not? He says, it will require a presidential signature. I said, you have your answer. Two weeks later, I get a call. I got your presidential signature from President Obama. So I trained for two months, lost 37 pounds, showed up full day of training and got to sort of the edge of space. Bezos and Sir Richard Branson from launch to landing only went up for 11 minutes, cost them billions of dollars, and they only saw the curvature of the earth for one minute. I sat in the sounds of silence looking at the curvature of the earth for five hours, gazing in the endless blackness of the universe, pondering eternity. Changed my life forever. Didn't cost me a dime. So I've given over 350 free speeches to the military. It's the way I serve my country, as I said. And in the law of, of, of reciprocity, psychological reciprocity, as we give, 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 as we serve, 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 as we turn every sales pitch into a serve pitch, how can I help you? What can I do for you and your family? How may I serve you? How may I serve our country? What goes around comes back around. Karma is a real deal. And service before self is how I've been able to do all these extraordinary things in my life. Serve on the Olympic Committee and run the Olympic torch. You name so anything incredible. that I've checked off in my bucket list, and it's because of the six degrees of separation, which are really about two degrees of separation, initiated by my mindset and heart set. What can I do for you with a commitment? Yeah. So everyone with whom I come, come in contact with, person and online, my, my dream, my goal, my prayer is that everyone leaves me saying, I like me best when I'm with you. I want to see you again. Mm. Long answer to service before self, but anyone can get anything in life that you want if you're willing to help enough other people get what they want. Wealth flows through you, not to you. Yes. Service before self should be our anchor motivation behind every single personal and professional relationship. And I'm I'm testament to the fact that you can actually make your dreams come true. You can keep checking off these bucket lists. You can meet whoever you want to meet. You can interview whomever you want to interview. You can go wherever you want to go. If first you figure out what you can do for them that will embellish their life and help them make themselves better than they were before they, 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 they met you. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, <laughs> so in my way of, of tracking everything that you're saying, and I'm also just applying like, wow. Okay. So 
where would the barrier be between, you know, what's the difference between you going through the steps of service before self and then someone else, and then the opportunity that you asked for, right? Um, along your way, or that you said yes to when the opportunity came down the conveyor belt of life, right? And That's a great question. So, so I would suspect that if you and I decided to team up and attend someone else's conference, 99% of those people in attendance would be there saying, what's in it for me? Pour into me, fill, fill me up. Yes. And you and I would go with a completely different heart set. I'm coming to see what I can do for others. I'm doing to see how much value I can add to this agenda. As I teach public speaking, seek to bless, not impress. You know, mm. if you're nervous before you speak, it means it's about you. You think it's about you. If you're excited before you speak, it means it's about you and you get it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You know, and listen, uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't always this way. <laughs> uh, neither was I. <laughs> yeah. I think that we need to sometimes experience humility and sometimes that humility isn't something that we choose. It's something that um, we are placed within experiences and circumstances that create humility. Um, you know, the other thing too that really impressed me as you were talking is the fact that, you know, there was no shame for the experiences that I'm sensing that you've gone through, right? Um, things don't happen to you, they happen for you. And, and, and part of the way to be able to arrive at that, not just mindset, but of that embodiment of self, right? It's not even just a mindset. It's an embodiment of self. One of the biggest things that holds us back from that embodiment is shame, right? Sure. And I, I'm curious because I, I'm not sensing that there was, right? As you're speaking to me in this, but, you know, you went through some pretty trying times. Yeah. How long did it take for you to get to, or did you have some sort of element of, of um, feeling like it was going to be hard to share? That's such a great question, Sharon. You know, I would never throw my parents under the bus. I love them. But I grew up in a very interesting home. My dad, cotton farmer on the east side of Phoenix, very, very successful, started his own insurance company, his own financial corporation, never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. My mom, the greatest mom who ever lived, the youngest of nine children raised by a single mom on a farm in Southern Idaho. Older brother, Sam, seven degrees from major universities, that's sick. Father of four children, successful business owner, successful business operator, never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. Older sister, Deborah, graduated from the university in fashion, merchandise, and design. So she sells real estate. Very, very successful. Never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. Younger brother, Paul, MBA, Harvard grad. A very, very extremely wealthy and successful investment banker. Lives in the East Bay of San Francisco. Uh, father of five children, never an athlete, dark hair, dark eyes. And then there's moi, the only athlete, six, five, blonde, blue eyes. Can you see my parents in a social setting? So what does your son Dan do? Oh, he talks. We're so freaking proud. Tough, tough family to grow up in. So just maybe I grew up with conditional love. You know, I sure wish you were more like your brothers. I sure wish you were more like your sister. I sure wish you were more like your dad. And, and so my whole life, I was never good enough. And that's got pros and cons. It, it, it fueled early on in my life, a sense of, of, of enough is not enough, which is not always bad. It's, mm. you know, the only person you need to be better than is the person you were yesterday. No matter what your past has been, you have a spotless future. You yeah. can't control what happens, but you can always control what happens next. Take advantage of being present in the moment. So before that beca became a vogue statement, I was present in every moment, which 
was fueled by this conditional sense of performance under pressure is how I proved to the world that I was somebody. My earliest recollection mm. of resiliency, I had cancer in my throat when I was eight battling in the hospital. And I, I probably remember one or two days in kindergarten when I was five, but the rest of my youth until I was in the hospital is kind of a blank. And I was hospitalized in COVID a, a, a year uh, from, from this past Christmas, over Christmas for seven and a half days, stopped breathing. I was so sick, almost died in the hospital 30 minutes from it being intubated. And as the doctors and nurses flooded my room and I overheard their conversation that they were taking me into to, to ICU, I, I became that indignant patient and basically said, don't touch me, get the hell out of my room. And with remdesivir and Toradol and all the medications they were giving me to help me combat COVID, what got me out of the hospital released with pneumonia, sicker than I was when I was in there and allowed me to recover was my attitude of my whole life I've been told you can't do it, you should feel shame, which I did, to I can do it no matter what you think of me and no matter what the statistics indicate, get out of the way, I'm on this planet for a reason and I'm gonna figure out what it is. And I know that's not a medical explanation, but as a metaphysical human being who's spiritual and intuitive, my dear, I see you nodding your head. And you know what's so cool about you nodding your head? I want to point that out to your, to your viewers, your podcast uh, subscribers. Plato taught all knowledge is recollection. Mm. Which means when any of us say something that's provocative, evocative, profound, and our listeners nod their heads in agreement, we're not teaching them anything new yeah they are recalling something that they yes. already learned in a previous experience yes i'm not shedding absolutely no information on who you are what you've accomplished or where you're going in your life sharon or for anyone else in your viewing subscribing audience what we have to do is talk about those irrefutable truths that have always been true yesterday today and forever that apply to every generation every race, every gender, what is real, what is true. And as we subscribe to those true principles in a metaphysical understanding and a quantum physics understanding, yeah. what I learned about astronomy and astrophysics, soaring to space and landing as a, as, a, as a student of astronomy, when we put all of those sources together, we can become the best version of ourselves, which means your podcast is different than any other podcast I've been on. You, I should call your majesty because of the, the light and love that you're illuminating to the world just based on who you are and what you've experienced. Thanks so much for having me. I love you. I honor you. Oh my gosh, Dan Clark, I love you. And I just, I knew, I knew intuitively, I, I wasn't prophesizing, but I could sense because I've, I've been in our, you know, the room with you, right? Electronically, you know, remotely. Uh, several times now, and you always speak from your heart. And I knew that you were going to get me at one point, And I got a lump in my throat. I absolutely 100% got a lump in my throat. Um, and I'm happy that you continue to talk because if you had actually batted the ball back to me, I would have been like, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so but, you know, I have to excuse myself for speaking for such lengthy sentences without a, a breath, but I have never missed a speech since 1982. Incredible. I've had flights cancel and I've rented cars and driven seven hours through the badlands of Nebraska to make a speech in, in Rapid City, South Dakota. And that's not because I'm some, some noble man. It's because I believe in my heart of hearts, Sharon, that there's at least one man and one woman in every one of my audiences who is hurting as badly as I was. And if I can show up and be present in the moment and tell some stories and make them laugh and cry and maybe conclude by lip syncing three Britney Spears songs so they'll never be the same, <laughs> just maybe I can save a life. Suicide pandemic is on the rise. Maybe I could save a, an intimate relationship, a spouse, a significant other. Maybe I could help a child. Maybe I could save a business. And it's my moral obligation to give back to the universe, to give back to individuals because I was given so much when I was down and 
I hope I can say something or at least trigger a feeling or a, a memory that will allow someone to get back up and go again. Again, yeah. leaving me saying, I like me best when I'm with you. I want to see you again. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Dan, I think we're going to have a, we're going to write a song together. I think yeah. that's what we're going to do. <laughs> one of the things that we're going to do, but, um, one of another thing of the many that, um, I, I'm very mindful and aware of with you is this aspect of presence, right? Um, and, and you've, you've spoken into that many, many times during this conversation. Um, and the thing that I think is the most compelling and the most touching for many people is the fact that in your presence, you're really aligned with truth, the reality, right? The reality of what's going on. And, you know, you are you know, one of the uh, accolades is that you're a motivational speaker, right? And so I find that sometimes in motivational speaking, right, we're not really rooted in, in, in the presence of the truth of the moment of now, right? Um, and so in, in my work, right, I work and serve every single day. Um, and in all different areas of spectrum, right? Um, whether it's really super esoteric, spiritual, uh, or it's, you know, real significant mental health, right? And, you know, one of the things, um, circling back to what you said, is the reality of the truth of now is the fact that we're already starting to see new mental illnesses that have developed because of the experiences that we have been through. And to not speak on that, we would be missing people who need us the most. Yeah. And I just wanna express my gratitude to you for really being so present in that. Oh, well, thanks. You know, it's like ordering an Uber ride that requires that you enter in your current location. If you lie about where you are, the directions <laughs> won't work. So I think everybody really needs to pause long enough. You know, maybe I can, I can share just a quick tool. We're always talking about, I wanna be in the top 1% of income earners in my company. I wanna be one of the top 1% sales professionals. I wanna be one of the top 1% human beings in my community, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's just quantify that for a moment. 1% is pretty easy to, to, to achieve, to accomplish. In the, in, the, in the general scheme of things. There are 1,441 minutes in one day and 1% 1 of that is only 15 minutes. What could you accomplish if you were willing to wake up 15 minutes longer? I mean, sorry, 15 minutes earlier every day than you normally do. And I've written, I, I mean, I've read six, I've, I've, read one look, I've read one book a week for the last 16 and a half years, 15 minutes at a time. I stay, I stay in shape, write songs, 15 minutes at a time if necessary. And if you take that opportunity, you can learn a foreign language. If you, if you wake up 15 minutes earlier over the course of 30 days in a month, you've added 7.5 brand new working productive hours to your day. And over the course of the year, that's 90 extra hours. That's almost, that's almost a, a whole year of college education, of training and anything you want to learn about metaphysics spirituality religions for those of us who are afraid to go to hell spirituality is for those of us who already been there you can take <laughs> any direction you want one percent at a time mm -hmm. and then here's the great tool you take that 15 minutes in a day because i'm so overwhelmed how do you do what you do sharon how do you accomplish mm -hmm. these things that you have dan there's no secret sauce my recommendation take that 15 minutes that one percent of your day and create five minute segments, three five minute segments, mid morning, mid afternoon, and mm. mid evening. And in that five minutes, you do three things. Number one, you remove yourself from the environment. You yes. change your environment. You do something physical, you walk, you exercise to change your physiology. 
and you change your mindset. You stop worrying, you stop focusing on business, distractions of family, deadlines of work. You engage in the meditation modes that were, were taught from everyone under the sun. Yeah. And then you go back to your life. And if you do that three times, five minutes of a day, and then at the end of the day, you pull out a three by five card, you don't type it, you don't text it, and you write down one thing that you're grateful for, one thing that you have never known before that you learned that day, which validates that day, regardless of how bad it seemed to have been. Mm -hmm. You can create the person you dream to be. And it's a simple process that mm -hmm. allows us to let go, let God, let the universe, let source get in tune with who you really want to be. And then exponentially, you become it one day, one minute at a time. That's right. That's right. How do you get there? One small step at a time and breaking it down into those steps is incredible because, you know, when you're in a state of overwhelm, one 15 minutes, we, we can't even fathom, right? But maybe it's five minutes. Maybe it's one minute. Maybe it's the commitment. It's creating the commitment and saying, okay, you know, I'm going to commit time to myself. I'm going to create a system so that I don't have to think about what I need. I'm already in the habit of the structure of giving myself what I need. I love it. I love it. Right? It's like, it's like letting go of the concept that you are a multitasker. You know, we <laughs> proudly wear it as a badge of honor. I'm a multitasker. And when we raise our hand, what we're doing is publicly admitting that we're lousy to a lot of things. What would happen <laughs> using your word that you used earlier if we created harmony, not work-life yeah. balance, which is an either or proposition, mm -hmm. but harmony, which is an either and proposition, yes. which means we start thinking like a juggler. Mm -hmm. A juggler only controls the ball in her hand. Once she's let go of the ball, she has relinquished control. So why worry about it? Which really allows us, empowers us, forces us to focus in on the present, on the moment, on the ball, in our hand, on the priority right now and yeah. do whatever we can do to change it, to embellish it, to improve it. And then we let go of it and catch the next one. Multiple children, not all of them need the same amount of attention and unconditional love and non-judgmental friendship at the same time. They need to believe that, but now we can focus on here. Wow, you just skinned your knee. Wow, you just flunked, you know, math class. Whoa, blah, 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 blah. It's yeah. so easy if we start thinking like a juggler to put our minds and hearts in the present moment. And in my experience, maybe you'll agree, people who have, a, who have trouble being present in the moment, it's because their present sucks. Mm, it's so they meditate painful. or they try to escape by living in the past, which causes depression. Yeah. Or they try to live in the future, which causes worry and anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. present in the moment allows us to free ourselves from this negativity and use all of the energy within us, our mind and heart power, to focus in on what we're doing right now, loving right now. Yeah. We don't yeah. have sex, we make love. We right. don't touch, we feel. Yeah. We don't, we, we don't hear, we listen. We don't mm -hmm. read, we read to finish. Mm -hmm. Back to you, girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, it's so important for us to be able to come to some point of acceptance with where we are right now. I mean, you know, circling back to what you had said in the very beginning of our conversation, you had no choice but to accept when you were stuck for 14 months, right? Searching for the solution and the healing so that you could do the things that you were meant to do. Um, some of us have to arrive at that point where we really have no other choice. Sometimes we need to arrive at that in our minds where we realize we have no other choice but to do for ourselves. I've just so enjoyed this conversation today. It has, I, you know, when we turned on our Zooms today, I just said, I know we're going to have such a great conversation <laughs> because you have so much knowledge, so much wisdom and so much to offer to any conversation, um, A, in part through your own experiences, but also just in part because you are really a scholar of life. I love it. Thank you. That's the best compliment I've ever received. Thanks. You too. 
Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. And whatever the class is, is and, and, and whatever, and whoever is in this class as a whole, it don't take too long to call the roll. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's really true, but hopefully it will, it will in time, we'll, we'll more and more and more, um, we'll allow ourselves and create the space so that we can truly live the lives that we would like to live and accept, accept the conditions that we may have to choose in order to be able to live that life. And Dan, it, it's been such a pleasure. And I really, really, truly hope that you will come back again uh, at Thank some you. point in the future. And um, I just want to say, I, I am just eternally grateful and just have so much love for you. Um, you. Yeah, and can I tell people how to, how to stay in touch with me by any chance. Please, yes. You know, with this suicide pandemic that's starting to raise its ugly head again during pandemic and post, what everybody's telling us, the psychologists and the, the, the medical professionals, the counselors, is that if you can hang on for just another 15 minutes, if you've made a decision to hurt yourself or made a decision to, uh, to take your life, if you'll just wait 15 minutes, it changes your presence and you will not follow through. It's so critically important. And in that 15 minutes, it's so easy to be proactive, to tune into a podcast like mm. Sharon, reminding ourselves that we become the average of the five people we associate with the most, which means we must be willing to pay any price and travel any distance to associate with extraordinary human beings, even online. Yeah, even online. <laughs> well, please, if you want just a quick pick me up to, to divert your, your sadness, your, your hunger, anger, loneliness, fatigue, or sadness, the halts, you can follow me on Instagram at Dan Clark Speak. And, uh, and anytime I'm in an opportunity where I have a chance to recommend you to tune into or learn from Sharon, I'm her biggest fan. Please call on me to encourage people to follow you. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. Yes. And we'll make sure that we put all of your links in the show notes so that everyone is able to uh, get in contact with you and also just benefit from all of the incredible um, resources that you have out there, you know, through your YouTube channel and your Instagram. And um, there's so many incredible um, snippets of conversations that you've had with other incredible human beings. Most recently, I think it was Les Brown. I yeah, saw, Oh yeah, God, yeah. one of my favorites. Um, so, uh, power, yeah. Player, power players with Dan Clark. That's my podcast. And, and ladies and gentlemen, look forward to my interview with Sharon land. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in take this to the next level. I feel so guilty having flapped my jaws most of the time when I, I was intrigued and attracted to be on your show to learn from you. So as soon as we click off, I'm going to stalk you as many <laughs> times a day as I possibly can, my friend. I, I honor you. You are an amazing human being. Thank you for making me a better human being. Thank you. And thank you as well. You know, I just, I love how we can call ourselves up to one another and have such incredible conversations. So once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that your heart is smiling as much as mine is right now after having this conversation with Dan and that you definitely, if you aren't already connected to him, that you do connect with him. Uh, incredible human being, incredible leader, incredible um, uh, mentor and someone who can inspire you to be the best that you can be. So until the next time, everyone, peace, love, Thank and you. we'll see you soon. Love you.